Thanks very much for the introduction. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, I also want to thank uh, everybody for accommodating the unusual time from what I understand uh, for this seminar. I really appreciate it. So I want to talk about some joint work um, with uh, Arul Shankar. Uh, and we uh, really are mo we're motivated, and I would say at least I remain motivated by bounding torsion in class groups. That's somehow a, a problem that I consider quite fundamental and it has many applications and things that I've, that I've worked with. So that's um, that's what what I'll uh, present as our as our application. But really, what came out of this work um, is the sort of realization that it might be more natural uh, to instead of focusing uh, on class groups um, specifically as objects related to number fields, to abstract away and just consider finite Galois modules and consider a sort of larger category of what we call Selmer groups of these finite Galois modules, what we call and other people call as well. Um, and consider the problem sort of divorced from that setting uh, becomes a little more natural. And specifically, I'll argue that uh, for these objects, it's not actually clear, at least to us, what the so-called trivial bound uh, should be, and that in certain circumstances, the trivial bounds for these problems end up being a little bit better uh, than you might have hoped. Um, so that's kind of the big picture setup. So let me uh, now do um, move on to sort of the, the actual setup of the talk. So just to kind of uh, get our context in place, let's let uh, K be a number field of degree N over Q. And we'll let COK be the class group of K. And uh, everything is measured uh, from this talk more or less in terms of the absolute value of the discriminant of K, so it's called a D sub K. And then of course you have the, the famous class number formula, which relates a whole bunch of uh, important numbers to each other uh, about this field K. And specifically, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, this corollary for our purposes, which is that really, if you look at this class number formula, um, my cursor is visible, right? If I, if I move it, can I just confirm? Thank you. So if you look at this class number formula, from an analytic perspective, the uh, main objects of interest are the discriminant power here. This is sort of a big number. And then you have the regulator and class group uh, over here. So we can't say much about the regulator. In fact, it should, in some sense, be considered together with the class group. Uh, but if you drop it, because it's sort of at least one, you get the famous brouwer ziegel corollary that at least if you fix the degree n of the number field, which we'll almost always do in the families we consider, then the size of the class group is bounded above by the discriminant of the power of one half, more or less. And this exponent of one half is, uh, is, is basically tight. You can make field a small regulator and we expect them to occur with some frequency. So that's how the class group behaves. And the question that I want to focus on is, well, okay, even though the class group behaves, um, we know it's asymptotics and we know it's always a finite abelian group, but if we isolate a particular torsion piece of it, so we fix some integer m and we just look at the m torsion elements, and the question is, how does this group act um, as a number field k varies? And this question just comes up um, for various uh, degrees n integers m, uh, in, in, in various sort of applications to counting number fields, elliptic curves, there's a connection to Shimura varieties and Galois origin special points, there's connections to uh, counting weight one modular forms, um, and so on. So this sort of is a pretty natural question that, that shows up in various contexts. So the heuristic uh, that's pretty well known to people who work with these kinds of questions is that to first order, you would expect this class group to behave like a random finite abelian group. Um, and uh, a random finite abelian group should basically be close to a cyclic group. Um, that's sort of not true if you zoom in enough, there's interesting uh, questions to be asked, but from a first order perspective, again, uh, you would expect it to behave mostly like having a large cyclic component and then some other stuff that's of much smaller order. So in particular, you'd expect it to have very small torsion. And there's this conjecture, which I think was first formulated um, precisely by uh, Xiao Zhang and uh, Brumer Silverman, uh, which is if you fix the degree N and you fix this integer M, uh, then uh, we had our upper bound of, of square root of discriminant, but in fact, you expect the M torsion side of the class group to grow slower than any power of the discriminant. So it just exists on a totally level, on a totally different scale. So this, 
conjecture turns out to be extremely difficult. It's far beyond anything we know right now. Um, we have the trivial convexity bound, just stemming from the fact that the M torsion piece can be bigger than the class group itself. And the class group is pretty much of size the square root of the discriminant. So we can get dk to the one half as an upper bound. Uh, but it's very hard to do better. So if you formulate this sort of subconvexity problem, um, uh, which is just sort of a name, there's no actual L functions going on here. Uh, but if we call it subconvexity, which is just, can you beat the exponent of one half for a fixed M and N? Um, this is already a very difficult question uh, and open in the vast majority of cases, even though, again, we expect to be able to take this delta MN to be all the way up to a half. So here is the sort of, here is a summary, as far as I know, I think, of um, basically all the previous work that's known on this. Um, so the notation, again, is delta MN represents the saving you can get over one half when you deal with M torsion in fields of degree N. And uh, you can do a little better if you specify more things like if you restrict the Galois group or something like that, but I'll just restrict myself to talking about cases where you don't have to do that. Uh, so the most well-known case is the case of uh, quadratic of genus theory, uh, that's due to Gauss. So if you look at two torsion and quadratic fields, uh, that's very well understood and there's not very much of that. And then if you can bound two torsion, you can bound two to the K torsion. And so that case is handled. And then beyond that, we only have estimates. And uh, the estimates we have are as follows. So for um, three torsion um, in quadratic fields, uh, there's been uh, uh, quite a bit of work on this. So uh, many people have obtained upper bounds. There's work of Pierce, there's work of Helgott Venkatesh and Ellenberg Venkatesh. All these three methods are based on sort of different approaches. And the best upper bound uh, is due to Ellenberg and Venkatesh as the most recent where they save a full uh, one sixth. And then on the same paper, they also managed to deal with the case of three torsion in cubic uh, and quartic fields. And they get some explicit constant that's, they don't work out, but I worked it out at something like one over 200. I forget exactly what it is, uh, but they get some saving um, over the one half. And then if you look at uh, two torsion in an arbitrary degree field, um, there's a uh, work of Bhargava Shankar, Taniguchi, Thorne, myself, and Zhao, trying to break records, but not quite succeeding, um, of uh, we get a saving depending on n of one over two n uh, over the trivial bound. And then if you're willing to assume uh, GRH, uh, this is basically the trick of Ellenberg and Venkatesh is they show how if you assume GRH, you can get small split primes those small split primes can't be a very small torsion order because they're just too small to be principal. So you can get a bit of a saving there. And in fact, the way their paper works, it's very beautiful, is they show um, that you can often avoid relying on GRH due to sort, sort of um, reflection principles where you kind of argue one field or another has small split primes and that's enough to make the argument work. Okay, but these are all the sort of um, known cases so far, at least to my knowledge. And uh, the theorem I want to present is the following. So if you assume the refined Bert swinton dyer conjecture for um, elliptic curves, so it's not enough to assume that just the ranks match up. Um, we need to assume a certain formula as well. Then we can give a non-trivial bound for five torsion um, in quadratic fields, the save a 16th. Um, and then if you assume uh, Riemann, you can in fact do better, you can go all the way up to a quarter. And if you if you assume Riemann and get the quarter, then it's worth mentioning that this is also true for cubic fields because that beats the current records. Of course, if you um, if you don't assume Riemann, we just assume refined BSD, we can also get delta three, two equals one sixteenth here as well. We just don't mention it because it's it's not it's not more than uh, what's currently known. Um, moreover, you can sort of have the same story over function fields where um, you have some ways in some cases of doing better unconditionally, but not in general. And there were function fields, you can make the same uh, arguments. And in fact, our results are unconditional in that setting. We need to assume neither refined BSD, which is not known in that setting, nor GRH, because GRH is known. And I'll say something about that at the end if I have time, because uh, the picture becomes a little bit clearer over function fields. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to sort of exp explain a little bit about um, our approach uh, and how we think about, about this problem. 
So here is sort of the, the big picture heuristic method that we have. It's based on embedding into motives. I'm very uncomfortable with motives. So I'm going to give this picture with the biggest possible caveat I can, and that's blackboard bold. Um, so, but here's the idea. So the step one uh, of our method is to forget about the field K. So uh, instead of thinking about N torsion in some number field, uh, in the class group of number field K, we're just gonna remember the finite Galois module uh, and step away from thinking about ideals. And then the way we think about it is that we have these two categories. So on the one hand, we can look at finite Galois modules A and we want to bound some Selmer group that I'll explain, which uh, is some generalization of this class group or this M torsion piece of this class group up here. And on the other hand, we have motives floating about. Um, one motive is like this number field itself, but there are others. These motives tend to have um, class groups and these class groups satisfy some class number formulas that let us get at least in principle, some kind of handle on these objects. So again, in the, in the case of uh, actual number fields, you have an actual class number formula and you can get an actual handle on it with a brower ziegel bound. And then you have these two categories and then from time to time, you can embed one of the finite Galois modules into some motive as some sort of torsion-like piece. And that gives you an embedding, uh, both of these in quotes, of the Selma group you want to understand inside the class group that you do understand. And that gives you some quote unquote, trivial upper bound, just by saying that if this Selmer group embeds inside this class group, it has to be at most that big. And then the game uh, of finding sort of the correct trivial bound, one game you can play is you can look for the best M, the best motive for a given A, for a given finite Galois module. Um, so in other words, if you look at the N torsion of uh, the class group of K, you can, of course, re-embed that back into the class group of K itself. Uh, but the other thing you can do is you can go splunking for some other motives that you can embed it in, and maybe they have better trivial upper bounds, and, uh, and then you win, or at least you get some better, uh, some better saving. OK, so that's the approach that we're going to take. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about uh, these objects that we're dealing with, and then we'll uh, do some Jacob? There was a question by Igor Sparlinsky about uh, about your results. So um, the question was, you, you need GRH or BST and GRH? I think maybe Igor, if you can um, call Oh, oh. we definitely need a GRH as well as BSD. Okay. That was a question. OK, okay. thank you. So you need both. Yeah, yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, we absolutely need both. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you. The main, the way we get anything is by switching BSD, and then we can do a little bit better with GRH. Awesome. Uh, this will this will become completely clear once I describe uh, the proof. But yes, we definitely need both. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so uh, let me describe these Selma groups that we're going to be talking about. Um, so I should mention that the algebraic number theorists have uh, very precise Selma groups that they deal with, and they work very hard to get everything just right at all the primes, including the very difficult ones. For our analytic purposes, we sort of don't really care what happens at the difficult primes. So it's a much easier uh, concept because we, we only care about sort of rough sizes of things. Uh, what we do is the following. We look at our um, cohomology group. So if you have a Galois module A, you can look at the global cohomology. This is some infinite set. And then you can restrict for every prime V to the local cohomology over the completion of V. And then what we do is we do um, our best job at asking for this um, representation to be um, unramified. So in other words, for every V, we have an embedding of the cohomology of the finite Galois group, the Galois group of the finite field, acting on the inertial invariance, this maps in. And we just ask for, will the Selma group be all global cohomology elements, which at every place lie in the image of this group. So for almost all V, the inertial group acts trivially. So this is just H1 GFV mapping into H1 GQV. And then at the ramified places, here what we're doing is we're sort of picking, in some sense, the largest possible reasonable thing. You can also just say, well, I don't actually care. Let me say the verified primes that I want uh, the image here to be trivial. And that will make everything I'm saying work just as well. 
just because at this level of, of magnitude, there aren't enough ramified primes uh, to, make, to make a difference. So uh, just to emphasize again, that there's nothing um, very subtle happening here. There's no careful choices being made. This is a very loose object we're dealing with. So here are some basic properties of these finite Selmer groups to keep in mind as we, as we work with them. Um, so given a finite group A, we need some way to measure uh, complexity. So for number fields, we had discriminants. And what we do here is we're gonna say that L be the splitting field of A. So it's gonna be such that this Galois group is the kernel of the, of the action of the Galois group on A. And then we're gonna take a discriminant of that field and call that uh, D sub A. It's again, a very rough kind of choice. And then to make things kind of nice for uh, analytic purposes, we're gonna write these squiggly greater less than or equal signs to mean uh, things that are true only up to factors which grow sort of subpolynomially in this D sub A. So we're going to ignore small factors systematically through these conventions. Um, I want to point out that I'm being a little imprecise here, of course, because whenever I write little O of one, it means something goes to zero as you vary in some family. So I have to tell you what family I'm varying in, and uh, I don't really plan to do that. But in almost all applications, uh, what you can think about is you're just moving in families where the size of the finite abelian group A that you're dealing with is bounded. So we're just not changing the size of A, but we're changing the action of the Galois group on it. Um, and this incorporates sort of everything that I'm going to be dealing with in all applications. It incorporates this general machinery of like, if you have number fields of degree N, you're basically looking at different SN quotients of the Galois group and then doing some representation theory with those. But the size of the underlying finite abelian group is not gonna change. Okay, but if you, if that doesn't really, uh, if you're not worried about that, then just continue not to be worried and uh, we'll both be happier. So here are some basic um, uh, facts that are true about uh, these Selmer groups that uh, make working with them uh, kind of nice. So uh, first of all, in short exact sequences, they're not quite multiplicative. Uh, if they were, you could prove uh, essentially Zhang's conjecture, uh, but they're not. Uh, but they're not so far off. So you have this, first of all, sub-multiplicativity. If you have an extension B of C by A, the Selma group of the middle guy is at most the product of the Selma groups of the outer two guys. It's not true that it's at least as big as their product. Um, however, it is at least as big as each of them individually. <clears throat> so it can't get smaller by extending something. I also want to point out that in some sense, all of this exists in a counterfactual hypothetical world that probably we're not living in. So in reality, all of these similar groups probably just do grow subpolynomially in D sub A. And so everything is squiggly equal to one. So the only reason that I'm bothering to write this down is because we can't prove any of that. So up to what we can prove, we do have to worry about the fact that these guys might be big, even though in reality, they are all quite small, probably unproven. Um, and then you have this, uh, the other thing we're going to use um, is this uh, Puitute duality translated to our language. So if you look at the Cartier dual of a uh, finite Galois module, then its Selma group um, is the size of the Selma group of the original Galois module. In fact, there's some sort of almost duality between them, but we're not really going to care about that. We're not going to care about their size. Okay, so now that we have um, that set up, let me give uh, some example, uh, some examples of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So this is our first example of a motive. Uh, it will be uh, the case of an algebraic torus and I'll work with it in a very sort of ad hoc manner. Um, so let's, let's let T be our algebraic torus, uh, some torus of dimension D. And then we get an integral Galois representation by looking at the co-character group of this torus uh, over Q bar. As long as the torus is not split, you get some non-trivial action, which you can study. Uh, and again, to fix complexities, we're going to look at the Artin conductor of this representation, call that F sub T. That'll be the analog of our discriminant in the number field setting. And then what's the class group of this motive is just the usual class group of a torus uh, in, the indelic, in the indelic sense. You look at the sort of adelic points of the torus and you model by the rational points on the one hand and the maximal compact on the other. 
Okay, so then you have um, a Brouwer Ziegel type formula, uh, which um, is uh, due to many people. The analog of the class number formula is due to shear. Um, and then uh, myself, Umo and Yafa, have worked out this analog of Brouwer Siegel. The, the main input really is how to deal with a Tamagawa number. That's historically the hardest part of the formula that shows up. And uh, that was dealt with by Ono, which is why I'm including his name. And again, we write sort of squiggly signs, squiggly inequalities to mean equal up to factors of, in this case, the Artin conductor. So then you have the following uh, fact. If you take an isogeny between tori, we call that phi, then you can look at the induced map on co-character groups. Uh, and the co-kernel of those maps will be some finite abelian group M sub phi. And now we can relate all these objects together because it turns out that if you look at the induced map on class groups, then in fact, these two tori have roughly the same size of class groups. Um, that's known unconditionally. That's basically due to what I've written up here, the analog of the brouwer Zico formula. And so the kernel and co-kernel are about the same size. And in fact, it turns out the size of the, of the kernel and co-kernel can be measured in terms of the Selmer group of this M sub phi. So if you want to, uh, if you have a torus, you have its class group and you want to study certain torsion pieces of it, or more generally sort of Galois invariant torsion pieces, uh, what you do is look at the corresponding isogeny um, and you study that map between class groups and that will recover for you uh, the Selma group of this, of this uh, finite abelian piece. Okay, so that's very general. So let's uh, do some examples to see the kind of thing we're talking about. Because this philosophy I mentioned at the beginning of embedding finite Galois mod Selmer groups sort of into class groups of motives, it's already, uh, it has uh, non-trivial sort of shadows of it uh, just by studying tori. So uh, as an example, let's give applications to torsions of small degree fields. So let's start with three torsion of cubic fields. So take K to be a cubic field, let's make it S3 for simplicity. And let's take L to be its quadratic resolvent. Uh, then just to align things with the previous language, uh, we're going to let T sub K be the corresponding torus, so the restriction of GM from K to Q. Um, and then if you look at the corresponding representation rho, then if you reduce that mod N, that's just the usual representation rho sub K N. So if, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can recover the uh, torsion pieces of K by looking at the Selmer groups of these finite abelian modules. So in this case, if you look at, we're going to focus on three. So if you look at rho k3, which represents the sort of finite Galois module I've written up here, uh, its Selmer group is essentially the same size, essentially isomorphic to the three torsion of your class group. And now we have an exact sequence uh, of Galois modules, it turns out, if you work it out where you can look at the three torsion uh, corresponding to the field L. Uh, you can embed that inside the Galois module corresponding to the field K. And the co-kernel is just the trivial Galois module F sub three. And so things with trivial Galois actions aren't interesting. The Selma groups are all roughly one because they all come from Q. Q has no class group. And so what you learn in a very rough analytic way is uh, you get this transfer, this transfer principle for three torsion in cubic fields, uh, which was originally due to girth and then has been refined in various ways. Uh, but you learn that the three torsion of a cubic field is roughly the same size as the three torsion of its quadratic resolvent. And so this is already a case where sort of the trivial bound, upper bound of dk to the one half might be improved by instead plugging in dl to the power of one half. Okay, so you can set up uh, basically the same kind of thing in other contexts. So here's another uh, kind of general one you can do. Uh, if you let K be an S4 or an A4 quartic field, doesn't really matter. And you look at its cubic resolvent. Uh, then again, if you're interested in two torsion, what you want to do is isolate these finite Galois modules whose Selmer groups recover a two torsion in the class groups. And then you get these two different Galois modules, uh, rho K2 and rho 3 2 Again, you can write them down. Oops, sorry. They're very explicit modules. Um, they're four-dimensional and three-dimensional respectively with some Galois action. Now, they don't quite fit in the same exact sequence as last time, but if you take out all the trivial stuff, if you sort of take out all the trivial modules which don't affect sizes, 
then it turns out they both contain the same two-dimensional irreducible representation. Uh, and so you learn that the two torsion uh, of a quartic field is roughly the same size as a two torsion of its cubic result. Which by the way, is the reason that all the way back here, um, or something similar to this is the reason why the bound Annenberg vagators get here for quartic fields is the same as for uh, cubic fields. It's a shadow of this kind of transfer principle that you can access in this language. Okay, so before moving on, um, I want to mention that we've been working uh, very, very sort of uh, vaguely uh, or, or uh, sort of dropping terms that are subpolynomial in the discriminant, uh, which is great in a theoretical context because if you're trying to beat upper bounds, you're in sort of counterfactual land where everything is maybe very big and scary. In reality, these things are quite small. So you want precise formulas. You want to keep track of everything. And uh, everything I've mentioned, you can work more carefully. You can keep track of ramified primes um, and try to see what's going on. So here's an example uh, of a theorem due to uh, Gra and Girth. If you have a cubic field with quadratic resolvent, uh, then as long as you input some sort of niceness condition at primes that, that their join is unramified over the quadratic resolvent, you have this precise comparison theorem between uh, the two torsions. Um, and there's this conjecture of Lemmermeyer, uh, which is still open, that says if you have an A4 quartic field and you consider its cubic resolvent, then their two torsions in fact differ by at most two. So something uh, extremely concrete and small. So it's not known, but my uh, student Jackless, uh, who graduated a couple of years ago, proved um, the same, the, the correct, the quality at the correct order O of one, but uh, his 10 off from what the right bound should be. Okay. So now I want to explain how, how to do this kind of setup um, in elliptic curves, uh, which is what leads to the theorem that I uh, stated at the beginning. So suppose you have an elliptic curve E now, and I'm gonna write it in minimal loss stress form like this, y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b. So for elliptic curves, uh, it's a little tricky uh, because it's not exactly clear how to measure their complexity. One typical way is to use the height. So the height of an elliptic curve is uh, the maximum of a cubed and b squared. And we'll stick with that for now. But also there's another measurement uh, by the discriminant, uh, which can be kind of annoying in certain cases because they can behave quite differently. This won't show up for us. I'll explain why in a bit. But let's take this elliptic curve e. So yes. I interrupt you. There is a question from Joel Rosenberg. Joel, would you unmute, please, and ask away? Yes, my question was about this uh, thing for quartic fields. It, uh, you didn't um, uh, put any conditions on the ramification, uh, unlike the the uh, uh, cubic with a quadratic resolvent. Do you mean this statement here? Uh, no, the, um, going forward, you had a statement for LK, oh, yes, this oh, statement, oh. yes. That's right. Well, that's hidden in the fact that it's an A4 quartic field. That's a very good point. Uh, but it turns out that, uh, I don't remember exactly how this works off of my head, but there's a statement for an S4 quartic field still, and then you have to worry about, uh, about uh, ramification conditions. But if you insist it's A4, it turns out they're all automatically satisfied. Um, I don't right now have a good reason as to why that's true in my head. Uh, but all I can say is that like in the cubic field uh, setting, uh, if you make an A3 cubic field, so a cyclic cubic field, then it's quadratic resolvent um, ends up just being uh, Q plus Q. Uh, so that sort of drops down to a very degenerate case. So likewise here, there's some sort of uh, generation that's occurring and somehow that's removing all the bad ramification that, that uh, you might in principle worry about. I know it's not a great answer. I just don't have a better one, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's an excellent answer, thank you. All right, so, um, so yeah, let's go back to our elliptic curve. Let's let R be its rank and we'll let omega E be its minimal period. And then we have this refined BSD conjecture, uh, which we will think of as our class number formula. Um, in this case, 
Um, so there's a bunch of terms here. You can ask about uh, which ones uh, are scary and not. So obviously knowing what R is, uh, is a little bit scary. The torsion term here is quite small. We know how to bind, to bind torsion. Even before Mazur's work, this wasn't a problem. Now it's very much not a problem. It's absolutely bounded. Um, these local terms are also something you can ignore um, analytically. So essentially you get um, the class number, which is sort of the Tamagawa number here. That's the way we're gonna think of it. You still get a regulator, which you can't ignore. And then you have this minimal period. This is what I'm, what's what I'm uh, writing down over here. And then you have uh, the minimal period, which you can't ignore because it's actually pretty big. Uh, in fact, it's of size, sorry, this is a typo. This should be HE to the minus 1 12th. Uh, the next slide is correct. But the, the size of the minimal period is the height of the elliptic curve to the power of minus 1 12th, more or less. So if you have this optimistic uh, conjecture where you assume refined BSD, so that this formula is true in the first place, you assume GRH so that you don't have to worry too much about the L value here. And you assume bounds on ranks so that you don't have to worry about the R too much. Then the thing that you expect to be true if you assume all that stuff is that the, the sort of class number analog here, the uh, Tetzafravich group times the regulator is of size, uh, the height of the elliptic curve to the power of one over 12. So this conjecturally, you have your class number formula and it's as precise as you might hope for. Now, uh, I want to sort of point out that elliptic curves usually have Selmer groups already and Selmer groups. So we now have two things we can call a Selmer group, the sort of cell sub n of E, or we could look at the Selmer group of the n torsion gamma module E of n, and they're defined in slightly different ways, though, though not too different. They're both some sort of local restrictions on, on the same global cohomology group. Um, so it turns out that in fact, these two are almost uh, the same. And this is because at all good primes, at all primes where E has good reduction, uh, it's not immediately given from definition, but in fact, you're requiring the same kind of local condition um, at all of those primes. And then there's just not enough of the primes where E has bad reduction for us to worry. So we can use these two interchangeably. Jakob, sorry, uh, one more question from Armand Brumer. Armand, would you please unmute to ask away? Yeah, uh, when you were saying GRH, I thought for only the L functions of uh, Dirichlet series or something, you are actually uh, using GRH for the L function of elliptic curves. Correct. Okay, thank you. You just no need a decent right. lower bound on the L value or do you really need zeros to actually be on the line? Oh, no, 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 just, just, just learn the law of subconvexity stuff. We don't care about zeros. Just, just the L value for sure. <laughs> Other questions? No, I think it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let me um, move on now and uh, explain precisely how we get uh, this bound on the five torsion uh, using these kind of methods. So here's the only part, very frustratingly, the only part of the proof which requires five, um, three would also work. Uh, assume you have an elliptic curve over Q, which has totally split five torsion. We're totally split now because the Vey pairing exists. You can't hope for Z mod five plus Z mod five. The next best thing is Z mod five plus mu five. These elliptic curves exist for various reasons. One is you can write them down. Two is uh, the modular curve with full five torsion structure uh, is rational. So it's got many rational points. Um, and in fact, these elliptic curves don't exist if you replace five with any larger prime. Um, so frustratingly, uh, this method will not work for any larger prime. This is exact method that we're using. The general philosophy might, we're not sure. But start with that. And we're gonna consider the family of quadratic twists um, E sub D. And if you look at their five torsion, you just twist everything uh, by the quadratic character corresponding to keyword join root D. So I'll write it in this way. And because it's split, this is again where we use five, the Selmer group is uh, just the direct sum of these two uh, Selmer groups. This is actually an equality because this is an equality. So we don't even need squiggly equals here. This is on the face of it equal. And then here is the 
sort of trick which makes everything work is very simple. It's just that chi d5 is a uh, Cartier dual to its own twist by one because it's a quadratic character. And therefore, each of these two Selmer groups is of size the five torsion in Q adjoint, in the class group of Q adjoint root B. And so uh, you learn that um, if you get a bound for the Selmer group of the five torsion of this elliptic curve, you in fact get a bound for the square of the class group, uh, uh, the five torsion piece that you're interested in. Uh, and uh, that's very good. Uh, and that will lead to us getting an acceptable bound at the end. So, okay, we've sort of successfully removed ourselves from dealing with the field Q or D. We're now interested only in this elliptic curve. And so what's left is to just uh, relate the Selmer group to uh, the Tetschaf Ravage group and plug in the trivial upper bound and see what you get. So let's go through a little bit of analytic details just to see how it all works out. So uh, first of all, the Selmer group is very close to the five torsion of the Tetschaf Ravage group. You're off by the actual rational points of the elliptic curve. So you're fine as long as you can bound the rank. Right, you get the Tetschaf Ravage group is uh, at least as big as the Selmer group up to five to the power of the rank of the elliptic curve. So now you have to figure out how to bound the rank. And to bound the rank, we use this um, clever trick, which is due to a paper of, I think it was in the paper of Silverman that we saw it, and I don't remember. Uh, I apologize. Uh, but it's, but it's, a, it's a sort of standard trick uh, in the subject where because you're looking at quadratic twists, you actually understand the two Selmer very well. So the two Selmer group of uh, quadratic twists is bounded by the number of ramified primes. But then once you bound the two Selmer group, that already is enough to bound the rank. And so then you can turn that around uh, into a bound in the rank, which you can plug back into here. And that tells you that uh, the Tetschaf Ravage group is essentially the same, it's five torsion is essentially the same size as the five torsion of the summer group. Whereas in principle, if you weren't dealing with the family of quadratic twists, you would legitimately have to worry about the rank. Um, now, uh, the regulator you can show also is, uh, is not too bad. Again, in principle, you have to worry about it being very small. In this case, you don't uh, because the rank is not very big. And to control the central value, you could either assume Riemann and, uh, and be done with it. Um, or you plug in the best known subconvexity estimates plus like a tiny amount of work uh, and you can save an eighth off of the trivial bound, which in this case is d to the one half. That's d to Harkos right now. Um, you calculate the height, which because again, you're in a quadratic family, this tension between the height and the discriminant being different doesn't occur. It's whatever it is, d to the six. And so finally you plug all that in, you work, what you, you work out what you get and you get at the square of the class group is bounded by d to the power of all, all, all told um, seven eighths. So once you square root this, you get what you want. Uh, and again, I wanna emphasize that we only win because we have the square factor here. If for example, our elliptic curve uh, only had a five torsion point, but wasn't to the five torsion wasn't totally split. So you only had an extension, you wouldn't be able to put a two here. You would only have a one and then you would be, even assuming Riemann, you would only recover the trivial bound um, that you get from the number field case. Okay, before uh, moving to my next slide, which is there, um, I want to emphasize that uh, we're very much in the dark as to why this works. Um, so, you know, we had the idea to try it and then being uh, diligent members of the community, we went ahead and tried it and we got numbers that worked out and so we wrote a paper about it. But uh, a priori, before starting this computation, uh, it wasn't clear to us we wouldn't get a bound of like d to the 20. Uh, we have no heuristic telling us what to expect, even assuming all the right things at the end. Um, we just kind of hammer away and get what we get. So if somebody um, figures out what to expect with this kind of method, uh, that would be interesting in my opinion. All right, so uh, to end, I have, I still have 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, to end, I want to explain how this all looks um, in the function field case, because uh, in the function field case, 
everything is somehow a lot more concrete. Like in our field case, you can talk about other motives uh, and you can look at these uh, Blockado conjectures and their the equivariant Tamagawa number conjecture and you can try to make sense of what is, but it's kind of complicated and I found it hard. Um, but in our field case, everything is very, is very straightforward and it seems like at least if you can find motives where uh, things behave as you expect, it potentially proves Jack and Jack's function field case uh, in computer generality. That's, that's still a plausible approach, semi plausible approach to it. So let me talk about what things look like there. And I'll focus again on the case of uh, bounding torsion in class group static fields. So here's the setup that I want to work in. Um, let's let K be a finite field and D be some divisor of even degree on P1. Um, and let's let chi DL uh, be the local system on P1 um, minus D, which corresponds to the hyperelliptic cover. There's a bit of a choice there that I'm, that I'm ignoring, but let's not worry about that. And then essentially what you want to do if you want to bound sort of the analog of L torsion in the class group over the function field case, is you want to bound this arithmetic cohomology group where you look at this uh, FL local system over P1 minus this divisor and you want to bound this H1. Okay, so here is what our method of embedding into different sort of motives look like, looks like in the function field case. So uh, more generally than P1 minus D, then P1 minus D, let's let U be any open set and let's let L be a ZL local system on U now. And we're going to assume uh, later on that, that L really comes from geometry. So L will be some sort of cohomology uh, of uh, some variety over U, some relative cohomology group. Um, so L can be very interesting, but let's assume that if you reduce L, uh, local system L mod little L, um, that it's trivial. Uh, and in fact, in general, you probably want to assume not quite that it's trivial, but that it's a sum of twist or something. But for simplicity, let's assume that it's trivial, okay? And now once again, we're gonna let L sub uh, capital D be the twist of L by the quadratic character corresponding to P1 minus D. So now bar here means we're looking at cohomology um, over uh, little k bar, so geometric cohomology groups as opposed to arithmetic cohomology group. Um, and if you take cohomology groups uh, of the ZL local system, uh, you can do that before or after reducing mod L. And the nice thing now, of course, is you have Frobenius. Um, and so the um, left-hand side here is just the co-kernel of one minus Frobenius acting on the ZL cohomology group transferred with F sub L. On the other hand, the reduction of your local system mod little L by assumption is quite trivial. It's just this chi DL to the power of little r. And so what you conclude now is that the size of this cohomology group, which is ultimately what you're after, is bounded by this right-hand side, which can be measured in terms of eigenvalues of Frobenius acting on your ZL local system plus the number of one eigenvalues, right? You have to be a little bit careful because you have one minus Frobenius acting on this group. In general, you expect this to act uh, on QO cohomology to be invertible, right? Um, except for you might have some pieces where Frobenius actually acts trivially. And so you have to sort of manually deal with them. But what I want to point out is that um, unlike in the, in the number field case, in the number field case, you can sort of pray for BSD to be proven, and then you can pray even harder for the refined BSD conjecture to be proven. In the function field case, you can get at the analytic part, at least, of the refined BSD conjecture without actually needing to prove BSD. Because what's BSD in this context? BSD, which is basically the Tate conjecture in the function field context, is telling you something about how many eigenvalues of one the Frobenius has when acting on various cohomology groups. That's in its most sort of general form, the kind of statement that it is. Now, if you look at the setup, then yeah, we have these one eigenvalues, but as long as we can give some kind of trivial-ish bound for them, which you can in every setting that, that uh, we've encountered, you can basically ignore this as an error term 
and get right at the meaty part of what you want, which is this right here. This is some sort of global class group, uh, which is measured in terms of the product of one minus the non-trivial eigenvalues, the non-identity ones. So somehow you have access to this formula directly without needing to worry about the Tate conjecture. Um, right, so that's what I'm pointing out over here. Um, so examples uh, of this local system that concretely you want to look at include, well, if you let this local system be actually trivial, so one way to ensure its reduction is trivial is to make it trivial. So if you make it be Z sub little L, that amounts to just uh, doing the thing I mentioned at the very beginning where you embed the torsion of the class group into the class group itself and use that upper bound. On the other hand, if you look at the universal elliptic curve uh, equipped with five torsion structure, with full five torsion structure, and you look at the relative H1 and you take that to be little l and you apply this whole argument to five torsion, um, that amounts to what we explain in number theory uh, case in the first part of the talk. You're just applying this reasoning um, to this little l. So what do you need to make this work? Well, you have to understand the power of L that divides uh, this product. So in general, you have to worry a little bit about denominators because things might not be um, algebraic integers. And so to get a little bit uh, more uh, technical about it, you have to use uh, Newton above Hodge statements to sort of control the slopes of Frobenius, i.e. the denominators occurring in these alphas. But otherwise, this product is something global. You can read it off from sort of global uh, geometric information. You'll get some integer. You can bound this integer in terms of its actual size um, and get some inequality. OK, so uh, final uh, remarks over here for primes p above 5. What can you hope to do? Uh, so like I mentioned, there's no elliptic curve satisfying this. Um, so the exact method is not going to work. Uh, what would work? is if you assume uh, BSD and subconvexity or Riemann, maybe you can find an abelian variety over Q with full level P structure. So Z mod PZ plus mu P to the power of G or something. That seems unlikely, but if you find even one such guy, you can make this argument work. Um, yeah, more generally, if you have a motive, then the to actually make this class number formula heuristic work, uh, the closest thing we found is you have to assume block Cato and the equivariant Tamagawa number conjectures. Even then, it's not quite clear how things behave um, analytically, and it's not quite clear how to find these embeddings, even though in the function field case, uh, it really is very clear. Um, and so concretely, what you're looking for is the following kind of thing. You're looking for smooth projective varieties such that if you look at their cohomologies, whoops, if you look at their cohomology groups, um, then as Galois representations, at least if you reduce mod some prime, you just get something trivial plus uh, some power of something trivial plus some power of its Cartier dual. And we haven't managed really to find any of these guys besides these universal families uh, of elliptic curves uh, with five torsion and three torsion or sort of mild variations thereof. But uh, if you find at least one such guy, then you can automatically run this argument and get some result. So it feels uh, very tantalizing. Um, okay, that's all I had. So thank you very much for your attention.